Good morning to everyone. It's good to have you with us this morning. Uh, Pastor Tim and Josh are accompanying the high school youth on their annual ski trip today, so we'll be keeping them in our prayers. If you're watching online, we welcome you. If there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. You can call the main number, press zero, and leave a message in the office, and someone will get back with you. Why don't you stand up and take a few minutes to greet the people around you and introduce yourselves if you don't know each other at this time. May be seated. You didn't sing that too well. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Must be having some difficulties up there. We begin our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. 
forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Jesus Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Continue with the intro. It. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the Son. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of us all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first reading is 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 9. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sothenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctifies, sanctified in Christ. Jesus called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and thanks to the, my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end. Guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let's profess together our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and we'd like to invite the children to come up for the children's message at this time. Good morning. Good morning was very loud. Okay, please stand up. I'm gonna wake up a little bit. I want you to twist, warm up, uh, touch your toes, uh, stretch up in the air. <laughs> okay, so my point, you can sit down. My point was really not to warm you up for this morning. It was to see if you would, if you would listen and, and do what I asked. Um, now, you did, but I did notice some looks of, why? Why are you doing this? Uh, it's church, right? 
So would you, if I asked you to, would you run a lap around? You would? Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to do that, but I appreciate you saying yes. So in, we actually learned about this in Sunday school, the older kids last week, part of it in a different uh, part of the Bible, in a different gospel. But today we learned about how some of Jesus' first disciples came to him. They were actually John's followers, and they heard about Jesus, and they saw Jesus. And when John said, that's him, that's the guy, who did they follow? Did they follow John, or did they follow Jesus? They did. They followed Jesus, right? They were super excited about it. Now, I have another question for you. When your parents ask you to get up in the morning, do you jump out of bed? Do you jump out of bed ready, or do you kind of just lay there? I, I say that. You know what I do when my alarm goes off? Snooze. Snooze. So I, I appreciate that you didn't tell me, oh, yeah, I get right up. You know, you're not telling stories. I appreciate that. Now, do you think if Jesus came up to you, what, what did his disciples do? Did they think about it? Did they talk to each other about it? What did they do? They went to Jesus. In another gospel, it says that like, James and John, they, they dropped their nets and left. Now, that's not something that fishermen do, right? Because that's how they make a living. They don't just drop their things. They don't drop their tools and walk off. But Jesus was special enough that they did that for him. So, I asked you to do some silly stuff today, just to see if you would do it. But when Jesus comes to us, what does he ask us to do? Okay, so Isaiah said, he doesn't ask us to do silly stuff. He asks us to go and tell other people about him. We want to be excited about being able to share the things that we know about Jesus, because there's a lot of people out there that don't know Jesus, right? And there are a lot of reasons why we want to trust in Jesus, but we need to be excited. We need to not think about it. We need to just, whenever Jesus calls us, like, you know, like there's someone at school who comes up to you and you know they don't, don't know Jesus. What, what is one way that you can teach them a little bit about Jesus? You can read the Bible to them. You can read the Bible to them. You can also sometimes just be nice. Because sometimes Whenever someone's not nice to you, it's because people aren't being nice to them. And so it can be really hard, but we have to be, share Jesus' love with them. But we can also do very specific things like reading the Bible or inviting them to church or Sunday school, inviting them to vacation Bible school. The things that we get to do, we can invite other people to do. So let's say a quick prayer about this. All right. Dear Father... Help us to be eager, followers of Jesus. Help us to keep Jesus as the first and most important thing in our, life, in our lives always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, last year, a number of people went to court in this country. Some famous, uh, just people, courts were filled throughout the, the country. And if they had a jury trial, in every case, in order for them to make a verdict, the prosecution had to prove, what, absolutely 100% their case? No. They had to prove it beyond a shadow of a reasonable doubt. Then the jury could give their verdict. But to ask for something to be 100% proven is or even our legal system doesn't require that. Life doesn't work that way, does it? We don't have 100% certainty. If you go to the airport and you have a ticket to fly to Phoenix, you have pretty reasonable certainty that that plane's going to get you to Phoenix unless you're flying southwest. <laughs> but if not, but you, you have that certainty and you get on the plane and you're pretty certain it's going to be getting you there. When you take your paycheck to the bank on Friday, you don't have 100% certainty that that bank's going to stay open into next week, but you have a pretty good idea that it will, and so you deposit your money there, knowing that you'll be able to get it out next week if you need it. Or if you go out to lunch today, you have a pretty, you know, pretty strong certainty that your lunch isn't going to be laced with arsenic. And so you go ahead and you eat it, right? You don't have 100% proof, but you have beyond a reasonable doubt you believe that. So except in the fields of mathematics and formal logic, pretty much everything in life is based on not absolute proof, but, but certain to beyond a reasonable doubt. Today, the reason I bring that up is because I want to talk about the question, why believe in God? Why should I believe in God? And to do that, we need to weigh the evidence. But there is no 100% proof that we, that we can give. So the question is, why should I believe in God? Why should I believe that a God exists? Why should I trust him? Why should I put my life into this God's hands? Well, I want to underscore at the outset here, like I said, the existence of absolute 100% proof is unrealistic and unreasonable. Even our judicial system doesn't require that. But I think as we look at the evidence today, you will be able to see when, with, with quite a bit of certainty that the evidence tilts towards the side of believing in this God. People with rational, reasonable minds can, can deduce that there is a God. I don't want you to be, be like the man, Bill. Bill was in a terrible car accident. He, he hit head on into a truck, and he woke up in the hospital. He was in and out of consciousness, and the doctor, when he woke up, the doctor was hovering over him and he said, Bill, we have to get you into surgery. We think you have some internal injuries. And Bill goes, I don't want to go to surgery. I'm dead. And the doctor says, Bill, you're not dead. He goes, yeah, I am, doc. You weren't there. I hit that truck head on. There's no way I could be alive. Well, the doctor wants him to, to know that he's alive. He wants him to fight for life when he's on the operating table. He tries to think of how to convince Bill. So he takes his scalpel and he says, Bill, you know that dead men don't bleed, don't you? And Bill said, yeah. And so he pricked Bill's finger and blood came out. And Bill looked at that and he goes, Doc, dead men do bleed. So <laughs> I don't want you to be like Bill when you look at the evidence today. So look at the evidence and let it tip the scale in the proper direction. Some of you might be asking, why should we even ask that question? Why is it worth our time to even ask the question, is there a God? Well, first of all, because God has a great desire in his heart for you to know him. Listen to what Jeremiah 9 says. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, or the strong man boast in his strength, or the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the God that exercises kindness, justice, and perfectness 
over all the earth. You see, God's greatest desire is that people come to know him and believe in him and trust in him and let him fill their lives. He wants them to know that he is a God of justice, but also a God of grace and mercy. And the second reason why we should ask that question is because God has, uh, you know, uh, some, he's got a problem on his hands because Jeremiah 17 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? See, God knows our hearts are deceitful. We, our hearts lie to ourselves. We lie to other people. Our hearts are deceitful so that a human heart can see all the evidence. And God has written it in our hearts that he does exist. And yet people can see that and they can turn the evidence and deny that there is a God. So that's one thing. People can look at it and deny it and live like God doesn't exist. Or people can look at the evidence and say, I am God. I am my own God. Remember the actress Shirley MacLaine? Years ago, she was one of the early ones to get into all this New Age stuff. And I remember that in an interview, she said, the most pleasurable journey you can take is through yourself. The only sustaining love is with yourself. What's she saying? She's saying, I am God. I am my own God. I am a self-sustaining person. I take care of myself. Well, you look at that and you say, God has a pretty big problem, pretty, pretty tough problem with um, Shirley McSclain. But you know what? God has a problem with my heart. And God has a problem with your heart, too. God has a desire for our hearts not to twist the facts, but to believe what's there and to know that he really is the true God. He wants us to trust him. He wants to fill up that empty space in our hearts. He wants us to spend eternity with him in the new heaven and the new earth. This God loves you and he wants you to know of his grace and mercy because life without God ultimately is pointless. It's purposeless. It has no meaning. It's futile and it's filled with all kinds of fears and anxieties. So let's look at some evidences today about why we believe there is a God. Now, if you're a believer in Christ, I hope that these evidences will help you to grow stronger, that you will know with more certainty that what you believe isn't just a crutch, isn't just something that you made up, but it is real and you can put your trust in this true God and that you can share him with others. If you're not quite sure about Jesus and God, if you're not quite sure about all of this, then I hope that these evidences will help you to, to draw closer to God, to, to realize God is, is knocking on the door of your heart. He wants to, to come in and bring life into your life. So the three great evidences to talk about a little bit today, the first one is external creation. The external creation that we see all around us, this, this world, our bodies, human life, animal life, we look around and we realize this is from God's hands. This has to be there. This can't just be a chance action of, of some floating gases that bumped into each other. William Haley was a philosopher, and he said, there simply cannot be a design without a designer. And that was pretty much unquestioned throughout history until about the mid-18th century when the age of rationalism emerged. And they began to develop theories that would allow them to, to get rid of God. They didn't want God in the picture. And so when um, Charles Darwin comes around with his theory of evolution, that was exactly what they were looking for, something that would allow them to get rid of God. And then they could say this is all just something that's, that comes from, from nature. It's all just natural. You know, this is not something that God had to design. But when you look at that, does that theory make sense? Could some random gases billions of years ago just somehow have ran into each other and caused a great explosion and all of a sudden, over billions of years, this very intricate 
well-designed, you know, heavens and earth and our bodies that they just kind of formed over time by accident. Folks, mathematically, that is impossible. One mathematician tried to figure it out. He said, for that to be true, it would be like 10 to 243rd power. You know, that's 10 with 243 zeros behind it. That's how impossible it is for this all to happen just by chance. When you see something created, when you see something that's designed, you realize it has to have a designer. When you go home today, take the back off your TV set and look inside at the intricate design there. And then go out in your backyard and ask, is Pastor Hiller going to pay for my new TV set that I just now ruined? Or, you know. But when you go out in the backyard, ask yourself, did that just get there by some chance, you know, explosion in a plastics plant? And all of a sudden there was this well-designed television set? Of course not. It took people who were smart, who knew what they were doing. It took intelligence to put that together. So as you look at this world around you, is this just accidental? Did this just happen by natural th chances? Or is this part of God's design? Even Charles Darwin in his book, Origin of the Species, in a chapter called Organs of Extreme Perfection and Complication said, to suppose that the eye with so many parts working together could have been formed by natural selection seems, I must confess, absurd in the highest degree. It's absurd to believe that something as complex as the eye could just happen because of millions of years. It, that a cell, every cell is a complex organism and it, doesn't, it couldn't just happen by chance. All the things that happen with each and every individual cell requires a designer. Well, we know that because God's put that into our hearts in Romans 1.20, it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. You see, we know there's a God. It's been put in our hearts. But the heart is deceitful. And so many people have chosen to reject that. And they try to make it sound like they are the smart ones. And if you believe in a creator, you must be anti-scientific or you must be stupid. No, not at all. You have to look at what's there. If you'd like more information on that, there's a great book by Lee Strobel called The Case for the Creator. I would encourage you to get that and, and read that. But there's more than just external creation. What about internal conscience? How do, you, how do you, you know, explain why in every culture throughout the world there's this conscience that people have, that they value truth-telling over deceitfulness, that they value kindness over violence, that they value loyalty over backstabbing? Why is that? Because God has written the law in our hearts. God, there is a natural law that God has written into our hearts. So next time you're in your backyard, ask yourself, you know, how in the world does everybody have a conscience? That just doesn't happen by naturalistic forces. That has to be put there by God. Romans 2.15 says the requirements of God's law are written in our hearts. Those are there because of God. And then the third great evidence for God is personal encounter. It says in Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to admit something on the front end. This evidence in and of itself is not enough to prove God. But when you add it to the other evidences, it can help to help us understand that William Austin was a philosopher. And I want you to listen to what he wrote. Christian experiences, such as feeling the pressure, feeling the presence or peace of God, or receiving a sense of guidance, or feeling strengthened by God, all combine to make us even more confident of the conclusion that God exists. What he's saying is that thousands of well-adjusted, non-drug-using people 
can attest to the existence of God because they've experienced God who has set them free from the shackles of their addictions. They've had a God who has answered their prayers. They have experienced God who's brought peace beyond all understanding into their hearts and into their minds. They know that there is a God. And those include people all the way from ditch diggers to presidents, you know, people all the way in between. They know that there is a God. Now, some people will fake this, you know, and that's why we have to be careful about personal experience alone. I remember growing up, there was a television preacher, one of the first ones, and he said that a, a 500-foot Jesus appeared to him and told him that he needed to raise $10 million for his ministry. You know, Well, there are people like that that will say crazy things like that, but this, this sense of peace, the, the idea of answered prayer, we've experienced God. This can be the thing that helps us after we look at the, the creation around us as the, the, you know, the natural knowledge of God, the conscience, the law that God's put there, and our own experiences. You put those on the scale of your mind and weigh the evidence. Then you'll find the old Arabic proverb true. I know a camel passed my tent that last night. How do I know? Because I saw the footprints of the camel outside my tent. These evidences are the footprints of God. These are the evidence that God gives us in order to help us render a verdict. Do we believe in God or not? Believe in him, but don't act like he doesn't exist. So many people, yeah, there's a God, but they live their total life as if God has nothing to say to them. Some people, like I said, will say, I am my own God. I don't need some, some made-up God out there somewhere. That just doesn't make sense to me. But God wants you to weigh the evidence, and he wants you to see. And what God really wants you to know is that he is a just God, he is a holy God, but he's also a merciful, kind, and loving God. This God wants you to know that not only did he create this universe and create every one of us, he made it possible for us to be saved. He wants us to live eternally with him forever in heaven, in the new heavens and new earth. God loves you. He wants to come into your life and fill those empty places. He wants you to trust in him, to overcome your fear and anxiety of what's happening in the world around you. He wants you to put your trust in him and in him alone, and he will be there. And so, you know, look at the evidence, and if it's true, then put your trust in him. Put your trust, let God into your life, and let Jesus save you from your sins. Trust in him. So if you listen to this today, and you are a believer, I hope that it'll help you to to realize that when you say you believe in God and you believe in a creator, you don't have to hang your head in shame. You don't have to walk around like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of unscientific. I'm kind of, you know, just, um, uh, just kind of weak. No, you know, there's much evidence to prove, more evidence to prove there is a God than to, to believe that this all happened by chance. It takes a lot more faith to believe that this all just happened by chance than to believe in God, a creator, who loves us and sent his son to die for us. And if you're not sure yet, I would encourage you to weigh this evidence, but to pray. Pray about this. Go read the scriptures. God speaks to you there. God is knocking on the door of your heart. He wants to enter in and lead you into a relationship with him. God loves you. He's given you the evidence. It's there. He's written it in our hearts. He loves us. Just know for sure that he loves you and wants you to receive these great blessings that he has for all who will trust in him as their Lord and their Savior. We pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us continue now with prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today thankful that you have revealed yourself to us. Lord, we can see it in, in our own bodies, in the world around us, in the beauty of the heavens. 
Lord, we know that you exist, and we know that you love us because you sent your Son to save us from our sins. Thank you, Lord. And, and may we look at all of these evidences and put and just give the verdict that you exist and we love and trust in you. Lord, today we pray for, for peace in our world. We pray that, that the, the wars throughout our world will cease, that people taking the lives of others for senseless reasons will, will come to an end. Lord, for Peace Lutheran Church, we pray that you will bless the call committee as they prepare to um, interview a prospective prospective pastor here as he visits soon. We just pray, Lord, that you would bless that process and help the right person to, to come here to, to Peace Lutheran Church. Lord, we thank you for the Next Gen Ministry and pray that you would watch over them as they are on this ski trip this weekend. Bless them with uh, safety on the slopes and safe trips home. Lord, we pray also for the a thanksgiving for the marriage of Randy and Diana Middlestadt as they are celebrating their 50th anniversary. We pray for those who are hurting and struggling, those we know in our own lives. And Lord, we, we lift up today especially Tom Kent, John Carlson, Bob Lambeth, Ron Perry, Sandy Walter, Margaret Ziegler, Beth Pando, and Sandy Junk, and all who are suffering with respiratory illness. Lord, we pray for comfort and peace for the family of Larry Wessels as they lay him to rest this week. Lord, all this we ask in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. We continue with the preface, The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son Jesus Christ into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
May this eating and drinking of Christ's true body and blood now bless you and strengthen you and keep you in this one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Go now and serve the Lord. My sheet says video announcements. Do we have any video Good morning. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. I'm with the youth on their winter retreat. I, we appreciate your prayers for safety and for spiritual growth for all of us. Our first thing I want to ask you to do, get your camera out. So if you've got your cell phone with you, if you can get it out during these announcements and uh, set it on your camera, I'd like to have you to use it a little bit later on. First announcement, we are looking for some people that are willing to help with technology in our sound booth during our worship services on Sunday morning. If you would like to learn some simple technology to help us with live streaming or with our video screens, uh, we would like to invite you to talk with Joe, Joey Anulat and uh, have him answer any questions you may have and express your interest to him. Second of all, we would like to uh, invite you to put January 23rd, Monday night, on your calendar. That's the night when we will be having Pastor David Gadini, one of our pastoral candidates, uh, come and to visit. He'll be meeting with our staff and with other leaders in the congregation, and that evening at 7 p.m., we have a town hall meeting for the whole congregation to meet him and to hear from him. Also, on the emails that are coming to you during the week is a link that you can click on to listen to one of his sermons and to see a little bit more about who he is and his uh, ministry. And then finally, the reason I ask you to get your cameras out. You see the QR code down at the bottom? Well, coming up on Saturday, the 28th of, of January, from 10 a.m. until noon, we have a seminar coming out that's called Sharing Your Faith Naturally. And we would like to invite you to come and to learn some little tricks on how you might be more comfortable sharing your faith after all, our mission statement here is reaching our community with Christ, and we want to be able to do that well. So please put that on your calendar as well. Now may God bless your day, and may God bless your week. Good morning. And if you pray for that new pastor, you won't have to have me coming over as often, so that would be a blessing, so you should look forward to that. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We conclude with our final hymn.